Hey, it's Paul Bainis of GreatDad.com here with my weekly series talking to modern dads and trying to get a pulse on what's going on with fathers today. And I've got a an interesting guest who's bring a lot of energy to the show. Welcome, Tony Schmaltz. Hey, thanks for having me, Paul. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so you're you're a motivational speaker as well as a coach. So you've got a lot of experience doing this. You also have your own podcast where you talk about about the personal development. Oh yeah, big time. Uh, yeah, big time. So you're really deep into this along with with the story of your family. Before we get into that, though, I do have a burning question I think that is going to help our listeners maybe a little bit is in terms of your last name. You yeah. are, you're proud to to hold on to that mantle and be like, I'm going to be as schmaltzy as I can because that's my name and that's who I am. And I love that. Yeah. So <laughs> my burning question is, as I said before we started, like having lived in New York for 10 years, a smattering of Yiddish. I know what schmaltz is and I know what schmaltzy is, but I'm, I'm curious as to what the connection is from the, the rendered goose and chicken fat part to how did that become the sentimental or overly, you know, overly, overly. Yeah. 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 So when I was 17, I took an, ex I was an exchange student in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so in, in Germany over there being 17, I was all of a sudden just out of the blue, all the, the guys over there started calling me schmaltzy, started yeah. calling and I didn't know what, I thought they were just playing on my last name, you know, just yeah. a nickname, you know? And so I didn't find out until years later, or actually not years later, two years later, my host brother over there came back and stayed over here with us for a period of time. And he started calling me schmaltzy again. And I said, God, I said, Marcus, what is that? What do you call me schmaltzy for? He's like, you don't know. He's like, cause when you were over there, you were hitting on all the girls and you had the cheesiest pickup lines, the cheesiest. <laughs> and he's like, so we just knew you as schmaltzy. And so that's where he explained it to me. And if you look it up, the German definition of schmaltzy, not schmaltz, schmaltzy with the Y, is to be overly sappy or cheesy. Like oh. a joke is cheesy. And so yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, at the time, you know, 18, 19 years old, I was super offended. I'm like, what do you mean? That was, that's not me. Come on. So years later, when I became a coach, I was trying to figure out what it was that separates me from the other coaches out there. And one night I had a dream about that time where I was nicknamed schmaltzy and I woke up and I'm like, that's it. I'm overly sappy and cheesy. That's me in a nutshell. Here we go. So I started incorporating that into my coaching and, and using it. And when I tell people, when I'm talking to people about being schmaltzy, it's because that's who I am. But what right. I'm really saying is be the real you. That's who I am. Now help you. Now you be the real you, whoever that is. Right. Yeah. So uh, being the real you, I guess I was thinking that it would be a little bit more attuned, attuned to being vulnerable or being will, the willingness to be emotional. I mean, is that mm -hmm. tie in? I mean, if you are an emotional person, I guess you try to be the, the real you, right? But well, and, that, and that's it. So being vulnerable is a part of it because you, you most people can't really discover who they really are unless they're vulnerable and they get down deep into what's been, what's happened in their life or what's in the past that's keeping them from moving forward today. So yes, the vulnerability is a huge piece of it. Yeah. And so what do you tell your, what do you tell your clients who say something like, I remember when I was, before I got into coaching, I, you know, I had very little, probably very little self-awareness, especially pre-kids. Right. And I would think like people would say things like, you, you know, live in the present. I'm like, well, I, obviously I live in the present. My watch, I'm living right now in the present. What is that? You know, I don't understand you. Or the same type of thing is to be the real you. I mean, yeah. metaphysically, I am here. I am the real me. What do you tell your clients when you try to, I guess you're trying to pull that out to, from, for them and help them establish what that is. What do you say to like get them to jog like into what is the real you versus the presenting you? Right. Well, I start by asking them some questions around what is something that they really like to do and they don't do it very often because they're afraid of what somebody else is going to think of them. Oh, right. Like dancing. I mean, <laughs> like dancing, singing, whatever it is. It's usually something like that. And so, and it's funny. And I, I just, and I keep pulling on that thread from there. Cool. What else? What else? And when we start getting down to it, usually people have a long list of things that they really enjoy and they may not do, or they haven't done in a long time because they're afraid that somebody around them is going to judge them. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, I don't do this because I'm worried about what my spouse is going to think or what my boss is going to think or what my family is going to think. Okay, great. So wouldn't, would you say that you're not really being the real you then if you're holding these things inside? Right. So, and so, so some of those are just, are kind of benign things like, like dancing, but right. then there are other things like, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of questions? Right. Right. And I'm always curious or I mean, I'm not curious, but I'm, I have second thoughts. Sometimes I lie in bed and I think, you know, I'm trying to tell somebody like they should be, they should act out and be the real them for their career. But 
what if that doesn't pay the mortgage and they end up in the poorhouse and you know on and on with the with the kind of the you know the whole bad list of things that can happen if somebody gets off the hamster wheel that they're on that is leading to some level of success and suddenly they're you know trying something new right well well i try not to shell shock anybody <laughs> or, the, <laughs> or their program you know because again it, it it all depends on what people want <clears throat> in fact that's one of the things that one of the first questions i ask well what do you want to create what do you want in your life where do you really want and if that is that career path then we'll do some guidance around that i'm not going to tell them sure. to tell the boss off or anything <laughs> you know it's right. like oh your boss is a jerk to you well go tell him to kiss your no <laughs> so no that's not so really it's helping them first discover what they want and part of that you know the benign stuff you're talking about of what they're keeping inside that's it's just a little on the side to what do you really want to create in your life? Because a lot of people don't want to be on the hamster wheel and they want something more. They're not sure how to get there or what's holding them back. And then we can dig into some of the past. I mean, almost everybody has a story somewhere in their past that is, or stories, and we tell ourselves stories every day, stories that are keeping them from being who they really were meant to be or who they want to be or who they need to be, you know? And some, a lot of times the hamster wheel is not it. Well, I think it's, yeah, important in there is what you're saying is too, is that the, you have to have a rational conversation. That's where coaching is so good at trying to draw it out. So you don't say, you know, you, you hear these horror stories, the guy who runs, you know, walks in his boss says, I've had it, I quit. Now I'm going to go and be a writer or whatever. And then never can succeed at that. Hopefully with a coach, you work through the steps so that a transition into what you quote unquote really want to do is not that painfully abrupt. No, exactly. And there's a lot of people I work with that continue to work their corporate jobs yeah, yeah, yeah. and then do something else on the side that they enjoy. And, and as long as it doesn't interfere with their family time or they still have that separation, then they can be, be more fulfilled in their life because they can still handle that corporate job as long as they have this on the side, you know, whether it yeah. is a, a small business or an entrepreneurship in some way, shape or form, or if it's just going off and being a singer or whatever it is, right. you know, something something they can do on the side. And if it develops into something, they can make a career and actually replace, if not better, their income. Cool. If not, hey, there's nothing wrong with going to work every day. What, why do you think we so often live in of a binary choice of I'm either a corporate executive or I'm a chef and I can't be both of those things at the same time. Therefore, I don't bother to pursue this other thing, which may not be a full-time job, but it could be a, you know, a weekend hobby. Right. Well, honestly, that's a lot of how we were taught. And I call it the programming. You know, we were programmed growing up and we were taught that we, you know, go to school. We were taught by our parents at a very young age, by our teachers, by our priests or pastors at church, but whoever it was, you're supposed to do this a certain way. You go to school, you get good grades, you go to college, you get good grades, you get a job, you work for 40 years and you retire. And, or like you said, or you start a business, you do that. It's, there's, depending on who you were around growing up, you got ingrained into your mind how you were supposed to live your life. Yep. And that's really like, even in my most recent book, the very first chapter is forget the programming. <laughs> yeah. And so it's really the first place to start, but it's not everybody's going to see that. You've got to work around that with a lot of people when you first start talking to them. Yeah. And, and we're kind of lucky in the United States. We're among all the countries. We're probably the least... We the, we the least put people on a path at age you know, 11 or 12 in, in Europe. I don't know how it is in Asia, but I assume it's the same. It's like you're already putting a, put on a path very early in, in middle school. It's really hard to change. Whereas we do kind of allow that kind of exploration and change. Yeah, it, oh, yeah. You make a great point. I mean, again, spending the time in Germany that I did. I mean, from the time you leave middle school, you're directed to a certain type of high school, depending on where you're going to go. You're going to go into an engineering school. Or you're going to go into a business school. Or you're, there's... I think there was four different types of high schools when I was over there, depending on where your path was figured out for you in, yeah. in middle school. Yeah. I've known very, very intelligent people with a lot of potential who were, who, be, who got late, the manual labor jobs, you know, and they, they were, it was really hard for them to extract themselves from that uh, career path at a, at an age where they really realized that they were something more than what they had been assigned to <laughs> as their <laughs> Their lifelong job. Well, so I really want to talk also about your family. Maybe there's an overlap between the coaching and the experience with your family because you have this really interesting family story that I think a lot of people find that maybe it's a step beyond what they even imagine as a blended family. So maybe you give a synopsis of your fatherhood journey. Oh, wow. So I was literally thrown into fatherhood. So I, I was a stepdad before I was an actual dad. Mm -hmm. and, and it was crazy at first just because one, I mean, I always what, wanted- What age were you? I was 25. 25 as a first time stepdad. No. Yes. Yes. And my stepdaughter was four. She's actually visiting this weekend right now. And she just turned 25. So now she's obviously older. But when her mom and I first started dating, 
she wouldn't let me, she wouldn't introduce me to her daughter yet because she wants to make yeah. sure that's going to be a long-term relationship. And I, I get it. I understand. And then when we got serious and I started, and then we actually moved in together shortly thereafter. And then I was introduced to her daughter, Melinda. And I was like, wow, I've got a whole new level of responsibility now. Yeah. yeah. And it was a shell shock. <clears throat> Not only the shell shock of having this now daughter around, but also like you, like we talked about mixed family, my wife's Cambodian. So now I've got this Asian daughter in this Asian culture so mixed with my grown up Catholic, you know, in this, in the farm town, white farm town community to, to work with. And, w- and then a year later, just over a year later, our, my sister-in-law came to us and wanted us to take in her kids because she was having some hard times. Her husband, her and now ex-husband was having some hard times. And so we took in two of our nieces when they were nine and 10. So again, more Cambodian kids. And I'm like, wow. So now I've got three girls between the ages of five and 10 that, that we're raising together. And it was, wow, it was a quite the experience. I went from, uh-huh. yeah, I went from being 20 in my twenties, early twenties, doing whatever I wanted, single guy to, wow, I got all this responsibility now. And so the level of, at first, before I really figured it out, the level of stress was just like, like way up here. You know, I couldn't go out and hang out with the guys anymore. You know, I had to, it was coming home right from work and it was working extra hours to make ends meet because I wasn't making that much money back then. And we had a house, we had a mortgage and it was just, but then when you have that time with them, like we camped all the time and we'd go out and do things together. It's just like, it made it all worth it, made yeah. it all worth it. And then our son, our son came along three years after that. So yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot in terms of yeah. Of shared responsibility and the inner the inner cultural thing. Good on you if you were able to be a good dad. I think from what I can tell, there are step step parents come in two flavors, right? I don't know if this has been your experience, but it's either the person who's like jealous and angry, which is the kind I had, unfortunately. But oh, and there's the other one who where the even with the without the guarantee of ever having parent child love naturally you know, genetically, they throw themselves into it as if. The child, the children are exactly their own. They don't make any difference, and it sounds like it sounds like you did your best at being being the latter. I, I definitely did, I, and I did it from day one. I made sure to I made sure of that. And at the time, my dad was still around, and he said the same thing. He said, "Love those kids like they are your own. They are your own." And I was fortunate enough. I have four brothers, and both my parents were still around at the time. That everybody, all my family, also did the same thing. They, these are my nieces. This is these are my nieces and nephew. You know, they took them in as their own. The same thing. So they know that these are their aunts and uncles. They these are their family. Also, they call them Uncle Chris, Uncle Dave, Uncle Stephen, Uncle Ben. And so it's been great in that sense that everybody around us came together. And and even in the Asian community, I I was the lone white guy for the first probably sixteen years of that. But they were very accepting and. There are many times they messed with me before I started to learn a language, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I totally get that having biracial kids myself. I didn't, I'm not a stepfather, but it, it, the intercultural things certainly is a challenge, especially when you talk about immigrants who are relatively recent. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm what, third, gen- second generation, third gen, se- second generation American, I guess. And my Polish ancestry is so far in the past that I, there aren't any, Pol- there aren't really any cultural implications of being married to me. <laughs> I'm just a random white guy. But if I had, if I were newly Polish, I mean, and holding on to a lot of Polish, you know, traditions and things, it complicates things, right? I mean, oh, big time. And, and so my, on my mom's side, that she is Russian and Polish. And so there's a lot of that in, from her parents that was very, in fact, from, from what I understand, my grandparents on my mom's side, there was a big controversy around them getting together because at the time, Russian and Polish was a big no. <clears throat> and so they ended up eloping back when that was really unheard of to do. And so, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that you just bring it up to Polish. I was like, yeah, I got some Polish too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, but the, and then the Asian thing is so different too from what we are used to in the West are, are the things that really pop up that surprise you in the way your in-laws think of, I don't know, holidays or education or anything else that you weren't, wouldn't have expected? So holidays, not so much because they, they don't celebrate. I mean, like yeah. the American holidays that we do. However, but even that is a, a big thing. Like if you want to go all in on Christmas and they don't, how do you get people to participate? No. Yeah. And for many, for many years, we bought Christmas presents for their children because they weren't. And right. So- they yeah. saw all their friends at school getting presents and we would buy stuff for them. But what the biggest shell shock for me, or not shell shock per se, but the eye opener was 
one, the food they ate because <laughs> they eat everything. There's things that you wouldn't even think that you should be on a plate, but we, ate, we eat them now <laughs> and I eat it now. <laughs> and the second was they have a great work ethic. However, they spend too much time working and not enough time with their families. Their, their children in, in many cases didn't, don't really know who their parents are. They're starting to rediscover their parents now in their, when they're in their twenties versus when they were growing up, their parents were both working two or three jobs to try to have, they wanted nice things, but they couldn't, they didn't take a career path of growth. They just worked multiple jobs to have that income that they could pay for these things, the nice cars, the nice houses. And as a result of that, the children, in my opinion, suffered that from that. They, they didn't have their parents around. They had their aunts and uncles around. That was the closest thing. So that was kind of an interesting thing for me because I was always raised to, you know, get into a job, get promoted, continue to get promoted and grow your career so that you didn't have to work that second job or be that way. And, and that's the path I took. And so it was hard for me to see that on that side from my wife's sister, siblings, brothers and sisters. And they all did that. They all worked multiple jobs. You know, it was really weird. But they were probably, were they more used to uh, what we would consider more of an old fashioned world where the, there was a village that took care of the kids. And when that village was all around, that seemed perfectly normal. Then you transplant it to America where <laughs> you're lucky if you have a, you know. Well, oh, what? no, you're absolutely correct. My, my wife's family comes from a, I, I say a poorer area of Cambodia and they actually escaped during the Pol, Pol Pot era. And, wow. and so when they got over here and they came over legally, they, but they were same thing. They were in a house of a bunch of other Cambodians and they kind of looked out for each other. So even when they got out on their own, you're right. They probably were kind of used to that. Yeah. Well, that must be a fascinating story of their escape from Pol Pot and escape from Cambodia after the war. Do you use that when you talk to your kids when they're growing up? I know that people often say, and I guess I often say this to fathers, is use some of those hardship stories. I mean, the one the ones that overuse is the idea of, you know, I walked four miles in the snow to get to school every day. But this, but that kind of thing where your grandparents actually escaped from a, you know, a murderous regime and they were able to do that just purely out of their own energy and will and motivation and I'm sure a bit of luck yeah and they, they've heard some of that from us but they've also heard it from their grandmother because and she just recently passed but she she used to tell the grandkids this all the time about how she took all of her kids the ones that were left because they lost some during that time they lost she lost her husband they lost they there should be five other brothers and so she took the remaining kids and they walked for days to get to the Thailand border before they could actually get out and go anywhere else. So I mean, it's just stories like that of, and then scraping by each and every day to make things, to just feed the family was, was crazy. And so they, they have heard a lot of these stories, both from us and from their, their grandmother and yeah, from their my, aunts and uncles. <laughs> my, my two in-laws uh, escaped from uh, North Korea, much of the same way. It wasn't like a dramatic across the, you know, across the Berlin wall type of escape, but it was the same type of thing of walking through the forests in the night and just uh, escaping that that way uh, i i keep on i guess I, my kids i don't feel like my kids are spoiled so maybe some of those messages got through but i do think that can be used to even though the kids and nicks didn't haven't luckily haven't had to endure that kind of hardship in their own lives they mm -hmm. can ki kind of see that they should be grateful for what they have because somebody very close to them actually you know had to take a lot of risks for them to even be here Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and they heard it from my, my side of the family too. Cause our growing up, we went through a lot of hardship ourselves. And so they heard it from both, yeah. both, both their Asian side and their white side of the family. And we had our hardships, but nothing detrimental. I mean, so we, things were tight financially, of course, but we, we always made things work. We always went on camping trips. We always had family vacations. We always had those things that worked out. And you know, at the time when the, especially the girls, when they were teenagers, it was tough. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was tough. And then now that they're in their twenties, there's a lot more gratitude than there was. And we feel it now. Whereas, you know, again, in their teens, it was frustrating on both sides. I'm sure now in their twenties, it's, there's a whole lot more, more gratitude, more love and more communication than there ever was before. That's, that's wonderful here to hear because I, sometimes that there is a rift through that, all that, the adolescence and the, the not really appreciating what the stories really mean. We also talked just a little bit before about how, about living with biracial kids and, or in your case, 100% Cambodian kids with you as a, the head of the family, how complicated that is in the world today. I mean, I live in San Francisco, so you know we're, uh, we have a very much a rainbow of every yeah. type of person. We went to see the fireworks last night. It's just, this, we're recording this July 5th. And my wife and I after, afterwards, like, 
that was the most international experience I've ever seen. We we're, were surrounded by all these people who spoke all kinds of language that we didn't even recognize. You know, like this was either like somebody's nightmare or the you know the greatest <laughs> event of what America really is right. that you could imagine. But so I don't know what my question is here, but I guess I am empathize with you of any struggles that you've had with that dichotomy because it is a, such a strange time your kids are a little bit older than mine so i'm i my kids kind of came to came of age in the last you know four or five years they're mm -hmm. 24 did have you had any awkward moments where uh, your difference actually is the one that's kind of sticks out yeah so the and this was an ongoing challenge for many years so many years i've always been very independent very self-sufficient self-reliant and believing that i can you know as the man of the house i'll handle it we'll take care of it and whereas in their culture it's not i'm going to call so and so i'm going to call so and, and oh. they're always bringing always people around and so oh, wow. i come home some days from work and there'd be three or four people well i needed help with this and this i'm like and so i'm expecting to come home to a relax to relax after work and then there's other people there so it was more the overabundance of community versus what I was used to of being more independent yeah. and self-sufficient. That's, that is an interesting one. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> it's, it was a fun one. And so like we mentioned before the show, so we're from Seattle area originally. And so it was, it really changed a lot when we moved to Florida. So we moved to Florida in 2018 and both our families are still back there. And it was a huge shell shock for both of us to be fully independent. Now you don't have the outside influences, the outside family around all the time. And we were able to actually live our lives for the for probably the first time. We, I, mean, I mean, we always could, but not with the extra influences. Like there was always somebody around when we were in Seattle, whether it was my side of the family, her side of the family, there was always somebody around and, mm -hmm. and it made it really challenging to just be us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we really, I don't think we ever really became ourselves as parents until that moment. And then, and, uh, and unfortunately that was when the girls were already into their late teens, early twenties. And then we just had, we had a bit of a shift, a bit of a shift in our mentality and our personalities. Yeah. I can imagine big change between Seattle and, uh, and Florida. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so getting, well, getting, as we, we kind of get to close to wrapping up, I always ask these three questions about, about advice and experience that you've, you've had. So is, is there some, something that you learned that was unexpected? And maybe we've kind of covered some of that about being a dad that you weren't really ready for, or weren't prepared for when you. Yes. Well, uh, the world. having three girls and yeah. all teen, all teenagers at the same yeah. time, I wow. found out the hard way that I was a way overprotective father. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I was a kid. I was a guy at 16, 17, 18 years old. I know what's going through their head. And so it was probably a bit of a surprise how much, how close I kind of held on to things. I didn't really let things happen. My wife was way more relaxed about the dating scene than I was. So that was probably the biggest shell shock for me. The rest of it, I think came pretty naturally. I really just tried to pour as much love as possible, but yeah, that was a tough one. <laughs> that was the one that I, still sticks with me. Having, yeah, having had a girl myself, I know uh, you walk a really a tight, tight rope there is that in terms of like being overprotective and alienating them. Cause I know that sometimes does happen. Like they mm -hmm. like, give me a break, just get a, a little bit away versus that proof of your love for them and the fact that you understand that it's dangerous to be a woman in a lot of situations and that you're doing this out of your love for them, not from a, a position of control. And I don't know how, how, how do you set that up? Do you have any ideas on how you set that up so that kids don't feel like it's about control? I mean, I just reiterated, I'm, you know, I'm looking out for you. I, I don't want anything ever to happen to you. You're the most important thing in my life. So I think my daughter kind of understood that it wasn't about you know, you must be here by 1030 or, you know, you're grounded. kind of. Right. Well, and the one thing I've learned from those experiences and from later experiences was that just like we were growing up, we learned from our mistakes or we learned from experiences. Yeah. And if you don't let them have those experiences, then they're not, they're not going to learn. So unless you have some sort of red flag, that's, there is actually a dangerous situation, then let them let them have their, let them have their time and let them experience both the good and, and the bad on their own terms, and then be there for them when they need that support from something that wasn't necessarily pleasant. 
Yeah, but it is hard to sit at home and wait for the the door to the door to open. <laughs> yes, <No>. it is. <laughs> yes, so, it what is. what advice would you have for younger dads, or maybe just general in terms of uh, adv- advice for dads of uh, teenage daughters? <laughs> is there anything you learned along the way that you'd really strongly say? You know, you really got to watch out for this. Yeah, and this is something that I, I've actively worked on more so in the last few years since becoming a coach. And I will, this is one that I don't regret anything. Although things I wish I would have had been better at back then is don't waste a minute. And what I mean by that is, yes, we're all trying to get ahead in life in some way, shape or form, whether it's a career, a business, whatever that is. And that takes time. Make sure you schedule, even if you have to schedule time with the kids, with your family, be there for that time. That's probably the best advice I can give any dad is just make sure and be there when you say you're going to be there. You say you're going to be at the soccer game, or you say you're going to schedule this time for two hours with them, be there for that two hours or more. Just if, even if you have to put it on your calendar, be there. Yeah. That, there are two really important things in there is the, the making time and then the not making promises you can't keep because mm-hmm. kids do remember that. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. They, it's almost better if you don't ever show up than if you keep on saying you're going to be there and they have to keep on being disappointed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and then finally, you, would you, if you were thinking, maybe it's related to that is if you had a challenge for dads for the coming week, what would it be? Maybe it is scheduling. Make sure you schedule an hour this Wednesday night. And... That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> when you mentioned the three questions before the show, I was already thinking that in my mind, the challenge for the dads for the week is schedule. If you don't already have it on your calendar, put it on your calendar, schedule at least an hour, at least an hour every single day in the coming week to spend with your children. And if you have more time, cool, but it makes sure at least every day you have at least an hour and, and you'll see how much more excited they are to be around you. Yeah. I often heard hear, hear people say or recommend, and I don't know if there's any science behind this, is that how important it is if, if you have you know four kids in the house like you did, is to make sure you have some of that time, not only with the four of them, but that you spend time with them individually, because that's a different experience for them. I uh, only had two and they were four years apart. So that wasn't as big an issue for me, but I'm sure for you, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to plan when you're trying to get alone time with four kids on a regular basis. Yes, it is. It is. And that's a great point. It's a great point. It is important to have that individual time as well as the time, the collective time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for all this. I think there's a lot of, a lot of inf- information here. We cover a lot of ground and I'd love to get into the bicultural, biracial thing. Maybe another time I, I yeah. do that. I told you I do this uh, week, uh, monthly meeting with dads of biracial kids. And it's, it's an, it's an interesting time. And I think if you at least have the mindset that you're trying to do the best you can at the service of your kids and that all the other stuff that's floating around the zeitgeist is to some degree noise, because you're talking about you and your kids, not you and the world and other situations. You're talking about you, your kids, your family. Yeah. It changes a lot the perspective you have on what you personally need to do. Big time, big time. Very yeah. well said. <laughs> okay, so uh, people can find you at TonySchmaltz.com and uh, you've got information on on your coaching. You also do a, a podcast, which we didn't talk about, called Wake the, Wake the Bleep Up.com, which unfortunately I did not hear, but it's on personal development. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds. And so it's, we have about ever any kind of anyone on there. We've had authors, we've had coaches, we've had scientists. We had, I had Dave Albin on the other day, who is the, he was the firewalking chief for Tony Robbins for 20 years. He oh. ran all the firewalking stuff. Wow. So I mean, it's just, we've had a bit of, we've had a little flavor of everything, but uh, we all, most of them always revolve around some sort of personal development, mindset shifts, things like that. And it's really great. We've had some great feedback on the show. Yeah, that's it. That I'll have to I'll have to tune in on that. I think the more we think about these things, it's not necessarily a pick up this book or listen to this podcast, change your life, but it's an evolution that we're on and we're kind of in a magic time of people being more introspective after, you know, millennia of just kind of just sticking to what is in front of us and getting it done. And now we're a little bit more interested in what the arc, the quality of our life is. And you can't do that without uh, some help, whether it's through books or podcasts or or personal and professional coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of help is always needed. <laughs> yeah. All right. Paul Venus with greatdad.com. You can find my coaching offerings and all the rest of it, including a free gratitude course for the people listening to the, the podcast at greatdad.com slash go. Okay. Until next time. Take care. 